Okay, well, good morning and welcome everybody. Uh, I am Myrtle Habersham and I have the pleasure of serving as the AARP Georgia State President for Volunteers. On behalf of our state director, Deborah Tyler Horton, and the hundreds of volunteers and over 1 million members of AARP in Georgia, we welcome you to the Complete Streets webinar. Uh, today, I'm especially excited to be co-hosting with one of our collaborative partners, the Southwest Georgia Regional Commission. They have been a partner with us for several years and we've done great projects. And we know that today we hope you will Agree will be both informative and interesting. Today, we've assembled some speakers who are experts in transportation as it relates to the safety and security of our streets, but also practitioners who will be able to talk about some of the challenges and commonalities that they see, whether they're in rural, in urban, a metropolitan area. So we want you to stay tuned, we want you to have another cup of coffee. Why don't you enjoy a couple of pastries on the side and make sure that you're annotating uh, any questions that you may want to ask. So after each session, if time permits, the uh, speaker or the panelist will entertain your questions. Again, thank you, thank you. Because when we talk about complete streets, we're talking about streets that will meet the needs of people of all ages and abilities. Remember that all ages ages and abilities. What are those things that we need to make sure that cyclists, uh, pedestrians, motorists, or people who are in transit uh, on transit systems have the kind of streets that are safe and secure? Thank you so much. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to our co-host, who is the Deputy Director for the Southwest Regional Commissioner, Ms. Barbara Reddick. Barbara? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Myrtle. Wow. You know, I don't really need to say too much. She she said it all, but good morning. My name is Barbara Reddick. I am the deputy director here at, and planning director here at the Southwest Georgia Regional Commission. I've been with the organization for 23 years. I don't like to repeat that out loud, but anyway, I've been there 23 years and I actually started out as a, a planner and I just worked my way up. Uh, I do a lot of... Um, just about anything here. But our region is it's very rural. Uh, there are 14 counties and 43 cities, and that keeps us very, very busy. We are happy to be partnering with AARP. They have been a solid partner. I mean, I, I'm sure they get tired of us, but we call on them for so many things, and they're always so gracious and most times when we call on them, there's not a lot of advance notice. So, but they step in. This has been a great partnership. And we, as Myrtle mentioned, this is a complete streets webinar. This is so vital in our region, particularly in our region. I, we, we, we will see, we, we'll hear other regions about other regions as we move through the webinar. But um, it's a, it's a, we have some challenges here in our region. And because it's so rural and because when you say complete streets, I don't know, it, it, it doesn't really resonate with a lot of people, but that's why we have these webinars. So welcome today. Uh, I'll be presenting later on in the uh, program and my contact information will be there. And uh, welcome and thank you for attending. Okay, our first presenter, and see Ron, you're gonna be the first, is Ron Knezovich. He is a safety, the state safety engineer and supervisor at GDOT, Georgia Department of Transportation. That sounds like a big role, Ron. <laughs> he does so many things and we actually connect on another level because I see his name monthly. I'm a part of a meeting that he holds every month. But he, some of his duties, uh, he manages the GDOT safety program and also he oversees the road and safety audits with the state and serves as a task team leader of a pedestrian and bicycle task team. That is where I connect with Ron. He is also the coordinator of GDOT Safe Routes to School program, another way that I connect with Ron. And he serves on the state pedestrian, he serves as a state pedestrian bicycle engineer. Prior to his role, he worked as a research assistant specializing in data science and emerging technologies within traffic safety. 
I'm going to read this last line only because I love it. One strive to utilize innovative and proactive approaches to reduce roadway fatalities in Georgia. Thank you, Ron. Thank, Thank you, Barbara. Thank you to everyone at AARP and uh, the Southwest Georgia Regional Commission for having me today. I appreciate it. So without further ado, I'll share and we can talk about a focus on pedestrian safety for older adults. Let me move this over. And just let me know if you guys have any audio issues that come up um, and I'll try to correct that. So three takeaways for you guys. One is that we know pedestrian fatalities and particularly those involving older adults are actually becoming an increasing concern. Proactive assessment methods are now utilized to combat these fatalities, and we can use traffic calming techniques as well as visibility techniques. There are also steps such as high visibility and safe crossings that you know, each person individually can do to help combat these safety trends. So here's the outline for today. First, we'll go over some uh, crash trends and older adult trends. Then we'll go into some of our strategies for screening, some improvements we have, some helpful tips for each individual, and then some resources followed by Q&A. So one thing we know and why uh, an aging population is becoming an increasing concern, simply because we're having a larger proportion of our of older adults um, walking on our roads. We see that the percent of the total population it, that's over 65, and this is true as well with 55 and 50, um, is become is older. And the amount is projected to double by 2050. We also know that as a pedestrian gets older, as a driver gets older, um, the, that crash is, if they are involved in a crash, is more likely to be a fatality. So what you see here is driver age on the x-axis and the percent that of crashes that are a fatality um, on the y. So as that pedestrian or driver gets older, more crashes are fatalities rather than just minor injuries or non-injury crashes. We also know that pedestrian crashes are coming in increasing proportion of our total fatalities. And I tell this to a lot of the engineers in the industry or planners, um, pedestrian safety is becoming an increasing concern for us. Back in 2006, less than 10% of our total fatalities had a pedestrian involved, but that number is nearly 20% nowadays. We see the same trends, or these trends are even more noticeable with an older population, and that's to do with that um, the amount of people being uh, above 55 is increasing. So what you'll see here is the percent of total pedestrian crashes that involved uh, or fatalities that involved an older driver, that percentage keeps increasing throughout the years. We know these are happening. One of the key causes is speed. The faster the driver's speed, the more likely that crashes for a pedestrian to be a fatality. We did a study with the governor's office of highway safety where we found that at our higher speed limits, the proportion of the crashes that are serious injuries and fatalities continues to increase. See the serious injuries in this grayish blue and the fatalities, percent of fatalities in purple. As speed limit increases, you'll see that percent of total fatalities continues to increase. And at lower speed limits, the percent of total speed, uh, serious injuries increases. But once speed limit gets high enough, um, most of those crashes are no longer serious injuries. They become fatalities. So those higher speed roadways are really a, a strong concern. But it's not just speed limit. It's also about driving speed. This is our fatalities across the time of day for pedestrians. What we see is it is not those a.m. and p.m. peak hours that are typical for pedestrian fatalities. It's actually at night um, where we're seeing a larger proportion or, you know, where people six, six to seven to 10 and nine o'clock, you know, hours where people are going to walk 
but they're also um, the people the it's not congested and people are speeding more and lighting is an issue. So one of the ways we're trying to combat those fatalities is through proactive safety, which simply means anticipating fatalities before they happen rather than reacting after. That's to do with the safe systems approach, if anyone's heard that term before. So one example or metaphor or analogy I think I like to use is the World War II plane example. So I once got a call from a citizen. You know, there's a hotline for pedestrian and bicycle safety that I tend to get lots of citizen complaints on. And this citizen tells me, well, I've been biking on this road, on the state bike route, and I don't have a bike lane. The speed limit's really high. Um, can you please try to do something to help? The first thing I said, you know, this was early on in my career, and I said, oh, I'll get right to that. I'll take a look at the crash date on the route. Well, this uh, driver, this cyclist tells me, well, you should probably take a look at more than just the crash data, though. Um, and he be, proceeds to tell me a story about World War II planes. I do not think he actually was in World War II, but nevertheless, it was a very interesting story. He tells me that back in World War II, planes used to get shot in the wings in the center of the plane, and that's where they would come back with the most bullet holes. So it became obvious what we needed to do to uh, reinforce these planes strengthen the wings and strengthen the center of the plane but as it turned out that was actually a fatal flaw it was the engines in the cockpit that were really the key locations uh, for safety concerns but when planes were shot there they just never returned home so they didn't have that data so bullet holes aren't crashes or especially not pedestrian crashes you know, this is an example how data can sometimes be misleading. So you really have to take a look at more than just one type of data source and be proactive with your safety assessments. So one way we're being proactive with safety is by assessing risk factors, not just um, our crash data. A key risk factor, is, as well as many others, but that we're assessing is demographic data. We've been using the CDC's Social Vulnerability Index um, to gauge pedestrian risk factors. This index used to be utilized for thing to tell governments where to prioritize resources during a natural disaster or a pandemic. Um, but we found um, in a study with the governor's office of highway safety that this was actually related to pedestrian and bicycle fatalities. So what this is made up of is socioeconomic status, um, percent of people unemployed, below poverty, et cetera, the household composition and disability. So the age of that population is actually directly related to risk factors for pedestrians, younger and older, as well as disabilities, uh, minority status and language. So not speaking English well or being from a foreign country, as well as access to adequate other uh, modes of transportation or not having a vehicle in their home. So need for other alternative modes of transportation. We found that each of these four categories was related to pedestrian risk, severe injuries and risk factors. And we did this study with the governor's office um, in both Atlanta, other urban areas, and even rural areas and found this trend to continually be true, a uh, correlation. So the higher that social vulnerability, the more likely there is to be a pedestrian crash. Now moving on a little bit to our crash data dashboard, and I'll bring I'll show you guys the link at the end. I encourage everyone to utilize um, our crash data dashboard. We have a public tool. You can actually see all the crashes that have been reported by the police, um, and you can read those police reports. This is something we use on a day to day basis, honestly, an hourly basis to assess crash trends, assess individual intersections, and much more. We've overlaid these factors on um, uh, the uh, factors like that social vulnerability on this dashboard called Nometric. And we can prioritize segments of various lengths. We can prioritize intersections, which is the node between two segments. Or we can prioritize long corridors just to find emphasis corridors to study further. 
And you can see we can also filter these crashes by pedestrian age, that social vulnerability, and about a hundreds of other filters that we have on this dashboard. But I felt these were the most relevant to bring up today. Some things we can do once we have identified this corridor, so we can implement raised crosswalks. We've worked on some typicals in cooperation with our uh, transit agencies to find a design here that works for the transit stops, but also works for um, pedestrian safety too. These are a proven safety countermeasure. Also implementing rectangular rapid flashing beacons, or you know, there's a couple extra R's there, but really just flashing crosswalks, which have a 47% reduction in pedestrian crashes and increase the yielding rate of uh, vehicles to pedestrians by 98%. That does not mean 98% of vehicles stop, that means it nearly doubles the percent of people that do stop. Finally, we have uh, pedestrian hybrid beacons. So these have the strongest crash reduction. So even if a pedestrian isn't using these compliantly, there is a ton of signage here and there is a signal intended for pedestrians here that is, that is very visible to any vehicle driving through the road that this is a pedestrian zone and they should be crossing here. These, these have a 55% reduction in pedestrian crashes. They even reduce all types of uh, crashes too, including vehicle on vehicle because they're a traffic calming measure. We also implement roundabouts, which are probably the best safety countermeasure you can come up with. They reduce 82% of fatal and serious injury crashes at a stop control or at a nearly 80% at a signal. Um, medians, always trying to get medians whenever we have the space, as well as lighting improvements, which are great for both vehicles and pedestrians. Something really small we do is simply making crosswalks high visibility. So these uh, high visibility crosswalks have the vertical lines here rather than just the transverse. It's amazing how from a distance you can barely see only the transverse lines, but you can see those that ladder format or any one of these from a distance. And these are reduced pedestrian crashes by about 40%. Another thing we're implementing, um, this is less of a safety improvement, but really something to help with those with disabilities and make it safer for them. These don't have anything proven in crash reduction, but we know that from an equity standpoint, it's vital to implement these across the state. So we're prioritizing implementation of these audible pedestrian signals uh, near hospitals, senior centers, grocery stores, uh, near the Council of Aging, public, public and government facilities, and transit stops to parking lots, and trying to get corridors in between these types of locations as well. So moving on from the safety strategies, so some helpful tips. Being highly visible is extremely helpful. Um, we have these armbands that we can hand out uh, for free to you guys, or backpack zipper pulls, et cetera. Putting them around your feet or uh, parts that move on your body is the best. As I said, 82% of our those pedestrian fatalities happen in uh, nighttime conditions. Making sure transit stops are a priority for safety or just crossing when you're crossing the road. Um, these are locations where people inherently cross to get to a bus stop. Um, and they're not going to go a quarter mile out of their way to get to that bus stop. So these are ones where you really should try to be on a very cautious when crossing because we see a lot of fatalities near transit stations. Know that higher speed roadways, more lane numbers, that means higher risk. Those are where you might not have more crashes, but you'll have more crashes that are a fatality. And finally, know that these two-way left turn lanes are not a pedestrian refuge. Do not stop in the pedestrian two-way left turn lane when crossing. Um, and we have a tough time actually putting median through these due to driveway access from uh, local businesses wanting to make sure people can turn left out of their business. Um, but really often the most, more safer alternative is going down to signal and turning right because we see tons of pedestrian fatalities where they're stopped in this two-way left turn lane. Now for some resources to finish up. 
our crash data dashboard. I highly encourage you, all you have to do is Google Georgia crash data to find this. Highly encourage you to explore this. You can see each individual crash and you can see tons of detailed trends and you can filter to your select city, county, MPO, regional commission, et cetera. Want to talk about uh, Georgia Bikes Bike Walk Summit. This will be November 16th through 18th. I highly encourage anyone in the pedestrian and bicycle community to come to this. We're extremely excited to have some working sessions um, for advocates, for engineers, for planners, and many more. Also want to talk about our rural active transportation plan that we're working on with Georgia Bikes. Um, this will be to evaluate our state bike route system as well as uh, uh, to develop some design guidance for rural facilities to improve them for pedestrians and bicyclists. And finally, if you're interested in joining the Pedestrian and Bicycle Task Tapes, we have all sorts of organizations here. This is only to start. Every regional commission is there um, and uh, all the transit agencies are there as well. We encourage people to come. Um, please send me an email if you'd like to join. And then finally, the Safe Routes to School program. This is one, if you work near school, then I encourage you to reach out to look up the Georgia Safe Routes to School and you can book an appointment, find one of our uh, outreach coordinators here and you can be a partner, one of 523 partners in the Safe Routes to School program. So finally, those three takeaways, pedestrian fatalities and especially those involving seniors, they're becoming an increasing concern. We're seeing more of them nowadays than before. Proactive assessments are now utilized to combat these fatalities. Finally, there's steps that any individual can take such as high visibility and crossing in safe spots that can combat these fatality trends. So thank you all, open up for any questions. Uh, you can see my email and phone number here if you uh, wanna follow up at another time. And pull up Great. The chat too. Thank you, Ron. Um, do we have any questions in the chat for Ron? Hey, Kay, this is Gregory Brown in Macon. Hi, Gregory. Greg. I'm doing well. Hey, Ron, how are you, man? Good. How are you? I'm good. I'm doing pretty good. Just have one quick question about that crash data. Um, when you go to the website, it has. Uh, it saying that requesting your crash report uh, is that free or can you uh, or is there a fee for it you to request a specific crash report um, you might have to charge do an open records request for that and it might charge you the engineering hours to do that okay um, gotcha. if you want a specific report so okay but just the details to of it Okay, but just to see um, the crash you in can your see all area. Sorts of details about it, like okay. what the pedestrian was doing on the crash data. Is that like if they were darting into traffic, um, the severity of that crash, et cetera. That's, that's free. And you can just look that okay. up on there. There's right, a cool. tab called where, and then you can see the spatial location of it on the map. Okay, thanks, man. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, excellent question. Anybody else? Thank you. Thank you, okay. Greg. This, yeah, this is Myrtle. Just one quick thing. Oftentimes we hear that communities don't have funds to inst to actually initiate some of these traffic calming uh, approaches or devices. When you're trying to decide prioritization and which one to do first, is there like a general assessment or several, two or three things that you definitely need to do in order to decide where you might get the greatest return as it relates to, you know, the issue? Yeah. Yes, that's a great question. Um, one of the things we like to do is it's called a benefit cost ratio. Uh, we actually have a little spreadsheet where simply you just enter your crash data. We actually have a dollar value for each severity level of crash. And we prioritize spots based on where we're going to get, you know, the biggest bang for our buck, um, what dollar value of crashes we're reducing for the dollars we're putting into it. So if you have to go put a roundabout in a spot to prioritize there's two lane roundabout, and we really can only prioritize those in very dangerous locations um, because otherwise uh, it's not, well, we could do 10 pedestrian hybrid beacons or 20, honestly. Um, in other locations. 
And I'm more than happy to send to any local government or any agency uh, our crash screening template where you don't even have to, uh, you don't necessarily have to do those yourselves. You can send us the screening and say, hey, Gita, we please consider uh, this as a potential candidate for your guys' safety funds as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ron. That was awesome. I will now introduce our next speaker, Nicole Smith. Nicole is a writer and a public health professional who is passionate about making connections with people and organizations she serves and sharing their stories. She holds a BS degree in biology with minor in general chemistry and uh, a master's of public uh, health degree with a concentration uh, in nutrition. She's also an alum of the 2019 America Walks National College, Walking College, uh, a former community health specialist with the city of York, Pennsylvania's Bureau of Health. She um, leads numerous community health initiatives uh, focused on walkability and increasing uh, safety activity through policy systems and environmental changes. Uh, Nicole is local, uh, living in Marietta, and delights in caring for her epic houseplants. And I and I mean epic. I haven't seen them in person. I've seen them in a lot of Zoom virtual uh, meetings and events. Uh, improving her Spanish walking and uh, her senior dog, um, and an avid reader enjoys creating her book related content on her book book what is it books <laughs> books to gram <laughs> okay i didn't want to kill it all yeah. right take it away friend so again thank you so much for allowing me to be here and share briefly with you about the georgia state walking college i had the honor of managing this program two years in a row and it was even made uh even more special because america walks uh as a national organization, we are spread across the country. As far as staff, we've always been a remote organization. So I was really honored to actually run a program in the state where I'm living. So um, it's been great to collaborate with many of you who I see are actually on this webinar today. So we'll start out with just giving you a little background about the Walking College as a whole. So the Walking College, as Kay mentioned, I was in the National Walking College in 2019, and it was a wonderful experience, but the program actually started, um, the wheels kind of started turning for this program back in 2014. So there was a retreat in, um, I believe it was in Pittsburgh, uh, amongst America Walks board members and, and staff, and just kind of assessing, you know, what do people need? What, we had a survey out at the time, and just we're trying to find out how to best meet the needs of, you know, the people who are in this walkability space. And it was kind of developed, you know, people are looking for more training and they're looking to build a network, to be part of a network. Uh, I'm sure many of you have, you know, tried to do some of this work and it's like, where are my people? You know, a lot of us are here today on this webinar, but, you know, those were the two things that we, that were coming through loud and clear was building a network, having more training. So uh, the program began. And in 2015, this is the first class. And don't they look so happy? They're like, yeah, we're in the program. So it's 2015. We have a picture of 2016. Uh, 2017. And then 2018. And these are just the photos I'm sharing with you today. But the National Walking College is still continuing. As we speak, uh, there's a program happening right now. And really... So one of the coolest things I thought as a person who went through the program and now as someone who is uh, working to facilitate the program is that it is a wonderful mix of professional backgrounds. It's just a very diverse group of people and it's not all professionals. You have uh, people who are community advocates. You have folks who are kind of like, you know, I see a challenge uh, with me being able to get out and walk in my community. I want to know how to help. How can I how can I make this better? So we've had local advocates, uh, community organizations, like I said, professionals who are public health related, transportation planning, elected officials, um, students, teachers, you name it. So 
basically the whole um, point of the program, and not just the Georgia State Walking College program, but the national program, the whole program as a whole, is to build the capacity of local advocates and advance policy systems and environment change to create walkable and livable communities. And I will backtrack a bit. Um, so like I was sharing earlier, we had the national program for years and uh, we had talks with AERP, I believe this was in like about 2020. And 2021 was actually the first time that we took on the, you know, the adventure of doing state focused walking colleges. And so Georgia was one of those very first pilot programs. And then also, like I said, came back again in 2022, and we had a second class of graduates. So, um, you know, we're continuing to do the program now. In right now, we've touched 14 states just with AARP. And then we also um, do work in Arkansas, which I uh, manage that as well. So it has just become a very uh, interesting new venture in the walking college realm. And you know, I know, like I said, I believe there's some of our um, fellows on this webinar today, but I just think that it really, there's building a network when you're in a national program, but there's something really special about doing it at a state level. And I just love seeing how, and I'll share our fellows with you in a bit, but I just love how this program brought people from all different parts of Georgia, you know, uh, rural, urban environments, um, different backgrounds, like I said, different, you know, educations on the subject, but there was this walkability theme that was that, you know, common thread that everybody shared. Um, and this is a program, it is time intensive. It's six months. Uh, the fellows do devote uh, 18 weeks and they have um, training and, you know, the best practices and they get to help build that network that they're looking to build. They are led by mentors in this program. And they do have individual coaching calls. And then the, out, the ultimate outcome is to develop a walking action plan. And just to give you um, a little summary of what our course entails, those 18 weeks are split into six modules. So module one, we talk about how we got here. So we're talking about, you know, systemic discrimination, transportation policy. Um, we have what's called walking towards justice. So kind of like, how did, you know, the infrastructure get to be how it is? How are there, you know, neighborhoods that have not been invested in? Like, let's take it back to where things kind of started so that way we can move forward and understand what needs to be done. Um, then we move into developing leadership because it's obviously a really important part of this work and um, really knowing how to like start a movement and share your story because storytelling you know, we can get technical all day, but it's stories that get to people's hearts and it's stories that really um, help lead to change. And then we move into organizing for change. So this is a, a whole module about organizing, you know, how to do events, programs, communications, and then we move into designing for people. This is my favorite module because we do use the AARP Walk Audit Toolkit. And I always say, you know, once you do a walk audit, like it's never the same. So when you're out and about, you're going to be like assessing the conditions and taking pictures and, you know, thinking like, how can this be better? Or, hey, it's already pretty good. Like, how can this be modeled somewhere else? So we really dive into that in module four. That's actually where our um, national program and our state programs are right now. They're currently in module four doing their walk audits. And we talk about traffic calming. So um, I took tons of notes from Ron um, of just things that I want to go back and, you know, uh, check out. But then we also want to talk about public policy, right? Because that's where change, you, re you really want to influence public policy. So what does that look like? And a lot of people, they're not either, they don't have the experience or they're not comfortable with knowing how to approach local government, um, even knowing like who does what in the government. So we have a whole section um, devoted to that, Incomplete Streets, Vision Zero, um, How to Avoid Gentrification. And then we round it out in mo Module 6 with Planning a Strategy. And this is really where all of these modules build upon themselves to help develop the Walking Action Plan. And this is just a few examples of Walking Action Plans in the past. So things as far as like establishing a Bike Walk Advisory Committee, 
uh, just really digging in and doing really intensive walk audits to gather the information to then take that to um, decision makers and see you know, what changes can be uh, made. Uh, really engaging public health departments and hospitals to do like a walking campaign. Walking groups are another popular walking action plan. We had several of those actually in the two years of Georgia Fellows. Um, advocating for traffic calming, walk-friendly community status, which that's a pretty big lift. Um, that was actually part of my walking action plan. And then um, I had finished the program right before COVID. So then in the middle of COVID, I said, you know what, I'd like to move to Georgia. And so I did. And I didn't finish my plan, but I had things kind of built in as a person who worked for city government. And so those things are still kind of working. So um, I love the fact that when you put this plan together, all of these plans are not a one and done. You have short-term goals, but we really want the fellows to look out about three to five years because change can take time. So we call it a living document where we want you to keep revisiting it and making changes and updating it as necessary. And then of course, uh, we've had some adoption of Vision Zero policies as well. And this is my favorite, one of my favorite slides. So this was our um, first class and it was awesome working with Kay. We were both kind of like doing this for the first time and we just had a phenomenal group of fellows who were really engaged had great energy, we're like really look, looking to learn. And um, we had, so the program is set up where we typically have 15 fellows and then you have three mentors. They're split into groups of five. And then those mentors really like help shepherd the fellows through the program, offer them that one-on-one -on -one coaching, help guide them through their walking action plans. So we had um, Armand Turner and, um, we had Eunice and Sally Flox, who joined us as our uh, mentors, did a fantastic job for, you know, first time going through um, this whole process. And we just had some really great results. And then what we did for 2022 is something that's a bit unique. So we actually asked three of the graduates from the 2021 program to be mentors for 2022. I think it worked out fabulous. Um, Greg Brown, who I know is here with us on the webinar, was one of our mentors. Carolyn um, Hartfield and um, Dave Marinak were our graduates from 2021 who then came back as mentors. And then you see the lovely faces. I'm sure many of you recognize some of the folks here at the um, at the bottom here. These are our fellows. So again, it was just great energy, and I, you know, I was really honored to be part of this program. And I have to say that, you know, the diversity that we had on all levels was really unmatched to a lot of our other programs. And I do think it's the intentional, um, you know, connections and partnerships. All of the people who were in the two year in the programs, both years, um, you know, Kay and I really like went through these applications. We talked it through and it was really selections from really strong partnerships that AARP had. Um, not only you know in each of these communities, but across the state. So we just had a really great um, selection of, of students. And I just wanted to pick out just a couple um, recent projects that have, I would say been completed, but um, are still kind of underway. So Keith Larson was in our 2022 class and his goal for his walking action plan was overcoming pedestrian challenges in a multi-use path network. Now, what's really unique about um, Keith, and I will say, when I was doing the program, I still was kind of kind of new to Georgia. I'd never been, nor have I yet been, to Peachtree City. But when we came to Module 4 to do the walk audits, he said, well, this toolkit doesn't work for us. And I'm thinking, how can the toolkit not work? Like, there's so many worksheets. There's everything you can imagine. Well, I didn't realize his community is kind of what you call like a golf cart community. There's a lot of paths and trails and the way that people get around is different. So I thought it was really wonderful. He you know, brought this up to AARP and they talked it through and they've added a multi-use path and trail worksheet to the walk audit toolkit. So, you know, very quick response to a need that's, you know, I never thought about it, but this is something that people need. So now that's a worksheet that's available to everyone as part of the walk audit toolkit. <clears throat> and then the photo on the left is actually um, he's working on, you know, in the along the trails, putting in 
handicap accessible like signage and making it you know much more accessible for all users. So um, that really turned out to be a really great thing. Keith was also featured in um, the walk audit um, webinar that was in May. I was one of the co-hosts for that. So we got to come back together and work again. So I just think it was really like kudos to Keith for saying like what was needed for Peachtree City and kudos to ARP for listening quickly. And this came together pretty fast. And then um, KR Groves is in Madison, Georgia. And I have been to Madison and you see Kay and I um, were able to join Kay, the other Kay, <laughs> um, in October for their age friendly designation. And that was the first time I've ever been to something like that. And um, Kay R. Groves, who she's in the photo in the gold jacket holding the plaque, her project was centered around Silver Lake Trail, which connects senior public housing and a community garden. So in the far distance of the photo to the right, you can see those little blue signs. And if you go through there, there's a community garden that's being that's developed and being worked on. And then on the left of this photo along the roadway, that's where they're planning and planning to put in a trail. And Kay, Kay came to the program already with some things in motion, right? So she, you know, the age-friendly designation, um, you know, was kind of already in motion. She had very good buy-in from her elected officials, which was fantastic to see. And, you know, this is a rural community. And I just think, you know, first of all, I think Madison is adorable. Like I went there, I think they, you know, the... Um, pedestrian safety features that have already been invested in are great, but this is another way, you know, put in a trail, make sure that it's accessible for those in the senior housing. Also, you know, providing access to this garden, you know, where there'll be like food grown and um, a good public space to share. And then also through the process of this and going through the program, there was also some additional funds that were leveraged as well. So it's just a really great example of kind of bringing all parties together and a really good testament to partnerships. I think this whole Georgia program was just a really great example of partnership in action. My info's here, so if anybody has any questions, I know resources will be shared and you can just send me an email. Thank you so much, Nicole. Mm -hmm. I know, um, uh, yes, we could talk all day about the work that you're doing. And I'm, I really appreciate um, Greg and anyone else, I apologize who have missed who was part of the walking college. Um, but I'm passing it on to Shannon to introduce our next guest. Good morning, everyone. I am Sheen Stevens, the planning assistant for Southwest Georgia Regional Commission, and I have the honor of introducing Chip Battle. He's with the Pecan City Peppers. He is the ride director and administrator of their Facebook page. To give Chip some time to jump right on in here, I would just like to let you know that as the ride director, he regularly organizes daily evening rides as well as weekend tours, and that you can learn more about Chip on our Complete Streets webpage on the SWGRC website. So take it away, Chip. Thank you, uh, and thank you for inviting me to be here today. I'm representing the Pecan City Peddlers. We're the largest uh, bicycle group in the region. Uh, we're the oldest. We've been around for quite some time. I've been a member for around 40 years of the Pecan City Peddlers. I've been an active member for that amount of time. Uh, but when we're talking about complete streets and cycling, we're mainly talking about uh, dedicated or protect, protected bike lanes. And so I'm going to be addressing that uh, in my presentation. Uh, Here's our logo. This is a group of us in Sasser, Georgia, where we rode the uh, rail trail that goes from Albany to Sasser that evening. Uh, unfortunately, there's about two miles of it that's not, that's not open, so we really can't use it that much, but it's a great trail otherwise. I'm going to start with bike routes. Uh, that's not something that the advocacy groups usually concentrate on. Uh, they're more with protected bike lanes or designated bike lanes. But bike routes are good also. Uh, the protected bike lanes and, uh, and designated bike lanes are mainly uh, looked at because trying to encourage more people to ride bikes. Uh, they'll feel safer. These are for people who don't feel uh, safe when riding in the streets. 
But when you're looking at someone like myself or many of our members and the constantly peddlers who ride our bicycles every day, um, a bike route is really all is is great. In Albany, where we're located, uh, we have a bike route uh, on Second and Third Avenue to kind of join together, and so uh, it uses both Third and Second Avenue. It's about probably ten blocks long. Uh, this picture here on the left shows a section of it. It's really the city planners did an excellent job in picking this street for a bike route. Uh, they added sharrows here at the bottom of the picture. You can see a bicycle with arrows above it. That's called a sharrow. This street is a wide street. There's about 20 feet between the curbing and the sidewalks that allows for full grown trees. And so there's plenty of shade, which I'm going to come back to several times uh, in my presentation. Shade is incredibly important when you're planning routes and you're trying to keep bicycles and pedestrians in mind. In Southwest Georgia, shade is one of the most important things you can consider. Uh, in the middle of the summer or even in early or late spring and early fall, there's a big difference in riding in the sun and being in a shaded area. And here you see these trees shade the tree, the street very well, and they provide shade for the sidewalk also. So, so for me, this is an excellent uh, route. You can see here it goes to the hospital, it goes to the riverfront trail. It can take you downtown using the Riverfront Trail, or it can also take you to Cheeha using the Riverfront Trail. Now, where the city planners went awry a little bit, and it would have been nice if they had come to us and talked to us because I think we could have given them some suggestions. Uh, they're taking us downtown by the Riverfront Trail or Jefferson. Uh, Jefferson's a two-lane street. It's one of the busiest streets in that area. Uh, why they chose to take it down Jefferson, I have no idea. When one block over is Jackson, which is a one-way, two-lane street with almost no traffic and goes to the exact same place. So why they chose Jefferson, I do not know. Two of their definite uh, destinations here are downtown and Chiha using the Riverfront Trail. This is our access to the Riverfront Trail from that bike route. It crosses the rail yard. The trains always park across the street. This isn't something new. They've always used this as a parking space. You cannot access the Riverfront Trail from this street. And they've even recently uh, you can't really see it good in this picture, but they've put up a guardrail across here, totally blocking off the street. So they've closed this street down. You can go about two blocks south on society and access the trail. But if you don't know that, if you're not familiar, because really these are very back streets, very few people probably know that, uh, you are cut off permanently from the Riverfront Trail using the bike route. Dedicated bike lanes, this is something that advocacy groups, the large advocacy groups really uh, like to see. This is one we have in Albany. It's been here for quite some time. Uh, we really welcomed it uh, when they first put it in. It's on Gillianville Road. Uh, that's a main road that a cyclist, we use this. This is one of our main routes in and out of town until just a couple of years ago. We were on this street almost every day uh, you would find cyclists on this street. Uh, about two years ago, the DOT repaved uh, Gillianville out in the country from the city limits to Calhoun, and it's an awful job and has made that road unrideable, and so we no longer use Gillianville outside the city. But inside of town, we still use this pretty good. It's, it's a good street to uh, get across town on, I ride this uh, bike lane numerous times a week, but I do want to point out just some problems with bike lanes in general. Uh, they 
our receptacles for trash, the cars push glass, metal objects, rocks. You can see trash here. You see grass growing up in it. It's not maintained very well. Here we have just a very small strip between the curbing and the sidewalk. No room for trees. This is out in the sun. We really uh, can't use this during the middle of the day. This is an early morning, late in the evening uh, route facility. And there's even a, a dead crow just outside this uh, picture in the bike lane. Because of the trash and everything that's collected in a bike lane, the bicycles tend to ride right on this left-hand white line. If you get further into the lane, you're coming across the glass and the trash and those kind of things. And so when I ride this, and everybody I know who does, we ride right along this white line so that when we do come across something, we can pull out into traffic to avoid it. So we're constantly coming and going inside of this lane. Cars in our area in Southwest Georgia are really very considerate. Uh, we have a real good relationship with cars. They give us a lot of room, except for when you're in the bike lane. When you're in the bike lane, they feel like we're in a bike lane, we're protected by this little white line, and they don't give us any room whatsoever here. They'll pass right along the white line while we're riding on the other side of the white line. This is the closest I come to cars usually is when they're passing me on this with this white line between us. And here, you can see our bike lane just disappears. It just, uh, for no reason, just when they were planning it out, when the city planners were planning it, I have no idea why we chose to stop it right here. There's no cross street here. Uh, this is actually a driveway to a business. Again, you can see it's very grown up. So someone who's not comfortable riding in traffic is suddenly just thrown out into traffic, whether they want to be or not. And this is only a mile from a McDonald's, a Waffle House, a grocery store, there's a Mexican restaurant, and Albany State College are only just one mile further down the road. So anybody who's going to any of these things, now they're in traffic. Uh, there's a, the YMCA is probably about two miles further down the road. And a school is right there around the YMCA also. So again, all those things, if you were using this bike lane to get there, now you're in traffic. And this is a fairly uh, busy road uh, with a, a high speed limit. It's, I think in here, it may even be 55 miles an hour. So it's a fairly high speed limit and you're just thrown out in traffic. Again, it would have been nice uh, if the planners, when they were talking about this, had talked to us a little bit about it. Uh, and we may have suggested, let's, let's move it further down the road a little bit if we can. Protected bike lanes. Now, this is what advocacy groups really like to see is protected bike lanes. Uh, this is where uh, cyclists who are not comfortable in traffic, this is where they're going to feel the best. This is the type of uh, facility that's going to encourage the most people to take up cycling, to try cycling, to try to commute on a bicycle, go places on a bicycle. And so this is uh, the most preferred bicycle type facility. We've just recently, in the last few years, uh, Albany has put in uh, this bike lane, a protected bike lane. Uh, it's called, it's part of the Flint River Trails. It ties, it's originally meant to tie our rail trail to the river trail. And so uh, it runs through the neighborhoods, tying the two together. They did an excellent job with it. It's basically a wide sidewalk. They came in and widened the sidewalk. Uh, it's decorative. They have these brick diamonds in it. Um, brick decorations along the side. It looks very good. Uh, on the second picture here, you can see it's got trees shaded. Um, the share the road sign uh, was there already. This is on Jackson, uh, which is, I believe the Swiga Council on Aging is also located there on Jackson in this general area. 
Um, some of the problems with this is that Jackson is a one-way street. The bike lane here is intended for two-way bicycle traffic. By it being a sidewalk, basically, it's crossing driveways, it's crossing entrances to buildings, it's got actually a, quite a few dangers thrown into it because it's a sidewalk. This street, I referred to it earlier, is a two-lane, one-way street with virtually no traffic on it. If I'm a cyclist and I'm headed downtown, this is the street I use. This is the street we all use. Uh, when we go to rides downtown, we'll have rides start from downtown. When I'm going downtown, I use this street, but I do not use this bike lane. I'm a lot safer in the street. In the bike lane, someone's coming out of their driveway. Yeah, it's, this is a one-way street. They're probably looking for cars coming one direction. There's a good chance they're not going to look for bicycles coming from the opposite direction. Uh, again, there's a lot of obstacles if you stay on this, uh, if you're on this path that do not exist on the road itself. Some of the things I threw this in here too. This is uh, one of the problems with this bike lane being a two-way access on a one-way street. Here we have a sign, society, warning the cyclist that there's a crosswalk and to use the traffic signal. As we can see in the picture, this is a one-way street. The traffic signal does not face in the direction of cyclists traveling north. And so if you're using this uh, bike lane, you have no idea if the red, if the light's red, green, whether you can proceed. Uh, it's really uh, a useless sign. And then I'm gonna talk about traffic lights. Traffic lights are a pet peeve for me as a cyclist. Most of us, if we don't ride bicycles, don't really understand what triggers a traffic light. When you pull up to a traffic light, you'll see these lines in the road just before the traffic light. These lines create a magnetic field that when cars, large magnetic uh, metal objects pull into this and they break that field, it, allow, it tells the traffic light there's something there that wants to cross the street. And so it lets the traffic light know it needs to change. Unfortunately, bicycles don't have a lot of metal in them, especially the newest ones. The newer bicycles are all carbon fiber. They have very little ferrous metal in a bicycle. We can have a whole group. We can have 20 cyclists parked within this area and never change a light. It'll just cycle through and we'll miss the light every time. Even motorcycles may find it difficult to, tra to trigger a traffic light in this system. One of the ways to get past this really quickly is for local uh, uh, communities to adopt what's called an Idaho stop. And it comes in two different forms. Originally, the Idaho stop was for traffic signs uh, in Boise, Idaho. They adopted this where they said that bicycles could treat stop signs as yield signs. And so a bicycle can pull up to a stop sign, slow down, assess the situation. If it's safe, then they can go ahead and cross. They do not have to come to a full stop. Many of the places that have adopted this have moved on and added uh, stop lights to this. So that now a cyclist and motorcycles can use a stoplight as a stop sign. They'll pull up the intersection, stop, assess the situation, and if it's safe to cross, they'll do so. Just like I did last night uh, after the oncoming traffic had made their turns, I crossed the street. So it would be nice if local communities would adopt these kind of ordinances uh, so that we're not crossing the streets illegally. Because we actually do this now, we almost have to, um, but it would be nice if it was legal. This is my contact information. If you have any questions, would like to contact me. I'm going to Thank advertise so our nut roll, which is coming up oh, on yes. September 9th. This is our largest, uh, this is our 
big ride every year. It's the largest uh, bicycle ride in the community. It's been going on for years. This is our 19th year as the nut roll, but we actually have been uh, uh, having an event of some kind ever since I've been a member for 40 years. It was originally the Lone Brow Century. And in the last 19, 19 years, we've called it the nut roll. Uh, so anybody who's interested in that, come ride with us. We have lots of options, uh, 17 miles, 30 miles, 60 miles, and 100 miles. Now we're at the part where we're going to talk, we'll talk with planners um, to actually see what each, in different areas of the state, how they are utilizing complete streets and uh, implementing them. I have the pleasure of having with me today um, is Amy L. Martin and Mr. Julio Portillo. And both of them are on today and they'll, I'll um, talk with you first and then they'll give you their perspectives from a planner's perspective. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Amy. She is a senior transportation planner at the Southern Georgia Regional Commission, our neighbors. She's been there for 18 years and her responsibilities include transportation network and transit analysis, multimodal transportation planning. She also does related um, transportation grant writing uh, for the Valdosta Allowance Metropolitan Planning Organization. And she received her master's in, in public administration with an emphasis on the public sector management from Valdosta State University, my alma mater. And also Julio Portillo, he's currently the executive director of Midtown. However, I asked him to be a part of this panel because he was previously with River Valley um, Regional Commission for 12 years. And I'm sure they saw a gym there and he got promoted and got an offer from Midtown and he's been there since uh, 2018. He ended up coming to Columbus as a result of um, he moved there after they had spent some time as he spent some time in Columbus as a child. His dad was in the military there, uh, and he decided to come back and live. Um, he serves as a member of the leadership team for Midtown Night City's Challenge Winning Minimum Grid Project, and he also serves on several boards in uh, Columbus. He and his wife Meg, along with the two children, reside there. And I am thankful that they are here with me this morning and participating. Okay, let me tell you a little bit. I, I can't tell you everything about our region, but I can tell you um, that we do have some challenges. Sometimes, as I said earlier, when you say complete streets, most people really don't know what it is. I didn't know what it is until I heard it and began to learn more about it. So the challenges that um, that I see and I've experienced and other planners have experienced, and I'm sure Amy and Julio can attest this as well. It's just educating, letting people know what complete streets are, um, also sharing information with them. I guess getting them interested enough to act, really, that's what you have. Sometimes if it's a problem, you know, communities are willing to act, but sometimes if they're not, there's not a problem, they they don't, they don't do anything sometimes. So we have that issue. We have shared with our communities model ordinances. We've actually conducted some walk audits with some uh, several of our schools in the region. Um, we are right now through our contract with uh, GDOT, we actually do sidewalk inventories. And mainly this is in uh, within cities, but we've done it in uh, most of our cities in the region. And when we finish it, we're actually gonna do a, the, a map of all of what we've done so that we can show the connectivity and the lack of. So as I said, we're trying slowly but surely trying to educate people on making our streets safer. And many times, even if um, they embrace the idea, uh, most of our communities, uh, uh, they don't have big budgets. We have some of our larger communities like Thomasville, Albany, they have more money than some of our smaller communities. Some of our smallest communities, I'm sure other regional commissions can relate to this. Some of them are not even open every day. Sometimes they're open one or two days a week. The budget just can't bear it. So sometimes when you introduce a new idea, you have to also introduce funding. One of the things that I see uh, as a planner that has uh, kind of, uh, that I see in our region are the roundabouts. I think Parker County was the first one in our region to actually have a roundabout. Um, but other communities, you know, it, 
hey, they're coming along, they're coming along. So things are, are getting better. Uh, you see on the screen there, um, we currently there are in this information, thanks to, we will share with me through uh, GDOT. There are currently four uh, roundabouts in our region and uh, two, some of them you can see were built with GDOT funding, but some of, one of them was, two, a couple of them were funded locally. Uh, we also have seven active projects going on, and most of those are actually in the pre-construction or the design phase. So that will, they'll be a while uh, before they're completed. Uh, however, that's still promising. You know, I'm I'm excited about you know what's what's happening in the region. We also have one project that is currently underway. Uh, the roundabout is a part of the project. Uh, it's on our Westover expansion in Albany. So I haven't been out there. I'm out there all the time, but I haven't been out there to see that. I don't know if that project is actually started or if I can see any evidence of it. But next time I'm, I'm in Albany, I am going to uh, go that way. But you can see the counties that um, um, have roundabouts either, you know, in construction or pre-construction. So this is, you know, as I said, this is exciting just to just to see that. Okay, as I said earlier, you know, you can't have, um, you can't have um, talk about complete streets if you don't um, talk about some funding. Um, GDOT has an excellent, I think, an excellent site. They have a dashboard where you can just key in your area or key in what you're looking for, and you can actually find that whatever funding you need. There are a lot of opportunities. I say more than probably we can write grants for. I know for us, it's very challenging, but um, with all of the money now that's coming down the pipe for infrastructure, it's difficult for communities to maneuver and keep up with everything and know what's available. We do on our website, and that'll be on the next slide. Um, we do on our website offer, we, we, we vet through some of these grants and we list weekly grant opportunities. You can go to our website and you can see what grant opportunities we post. We don't bet these because we get two and three announcements, uh, groups of announcements a week. So we, there's no way we can bet these. However, we urge communities to click on our site. Um, and this is in and out of our region. Click on our site, see what's available. And if you see something that might benefit your community, you can call us and we'll try to work through that process with you to help you write that grant. Also, we have good, I think, statistical data on all of our counties. If you are on the call today and you live in our region, you can click on your county and you can receive and, and, and actually look at great information that can help you look at uh, some demographic information about your community. And you can also utilize it if you are, are writing a grant or, or researching a grant or just need data. It's there. Uh, we have transit plans. We have a regional transportation plan that GDOT assisted us with. So our website, to me, is a uh, uh, place where you can get a lot of information. Um, there's our website. There's my contact information. And I am going to give way to Miss Amy. I'm sure she's waiting in the wings and just pumped up to go ahead and give you her presentation. So take it away, Miss Amy. Once again, my name is Amy Martin, and I work for the Southern Georgia Regional Commission, which also hosts the Valdosta Lounge MPL, and we cover 18 counties, 42 municipalities, um, and we assist with, assist with various planning initiatives. Um, today, I'll be speaking on regional complete streets perspectives in two aspects, complete streets context-sensitive design and the health-related benefits of implementing initiatives such as complete streets in your community. Um, Due to our time constraints, I'm probably going to go through this pretty briefly. So you all will get the slides and have my contact information if you uh, have any um, questions. So what are complete streets? Well, according to, uh, as defined by the National Complete Streets Coalition, complete streets are streets for everyone. They are designed and operated to enable safe access for all users, including pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, and transit riders of all ages and abilities, which you all heard some earlier from um, our previous speakers. So the benefits of implementing um, complete streets where applicable um, are things such as property values, tax base increase, business economy, jobs and tourism, um, increase an increase in health and exercise and increase in safety and an increase in the quality um, of life. 
complete streets are for everyone, all users and abilities, as I stated before. But however, complete streets design should be um, context sensitive. So it's very important to keep that in mind. The extent to which a, a, a street accommodates all those different types of users depends not only on the street itself, but on the surrounding area, the kind of destinations that are along the street, um, the amount of traffic it gets, and many other factors. Complete streets don't mean sidewalks and bike lanes on every single street, which typically that's what a lot of people think when they hear complete streets. So they feel that they have to spend all this money to implement like bike lanes and sidewalks, but it's re it really just depends. Um, so saw, uh, conversely, sidewalks and bike lanes are always the silver bullet that makes the street complete. Different solutions work for different types of streets. With that in mind, um, I'm going to show you some examples. So this is a rural local road. Um, this is actually within our region at Irwin County. It doesn't get much traffic, has very few destinations, and probably gets little to none motorized traffic. Um, so this is currently adequate to meet travel needs. Um, because of the context, it is considered complete. This is a rural principal arterial. This is a good um, solution for rural arterial road that does need bike accommodations because it has high speeds um, and high traffic volumes. Unlikely to have pedestrians along this road um, because the, dif the distance between destinations. So this one, um, and you've seen Chip earlier speak a little about this, about the, the white line and all, but I'm gonna talk about another um, design flaw with this one. So this one is actually not complete due to the design flaw. Um, there are rubble strips on the paved shoulder, meaning that people can't bike on the shoulder. So the rumble strip should have been installed on and just to the right of the white line at no extra cost. Actually, it wouldn't have cost any additional funding to do that um, to make the road bikeable. And this is another rural highway that went from having no space to walk or bike to having bike lanes on both sides. As you can see, that rumble strip is closer to the, the white line and you have more space to, to walk or bike, um, or rather just bike. I mean, the, the pedestrian number is probably pretty low along this stretch of roadway. So here's another one in Charlton County. What's interesting about this roadway is that sidewalks are not what you one would usually see on a rural roadway like this that has a good bit of space between destinations. However, they actually had a lot of people walking from the community that was just north down to the Dollar General store. So <clears throat> this sidewalk was actually completed through um, the GDOT Multimodal Safety Access Grant a few years back when they were doing that program because the number of people they did have or pedestrians they did have um, traversing that street. So switching gears, I'm gonna go over the impact that complete streets um, can have on the overall health of a community. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services has identified increasing the number of trips made by walking and bicycling as a target for improving the health of the U.S. population. So complete streets not only increase the quality of life in our communities, but it also increases the health-related quality of life. So you have physical activity, ac active transportation goes up, <clears throat> health-related quality of life, the overall health status of the community, and it, it can help decrease health care costs. So what is the health-related quality of life? The health-related quality of life, our HRQOL, focuses on <clears throat> the impact that health status has on a person's quality of life. Um, it can be increased by community-level resources, conditions, policies, and practices that influence a population's health perceptions and functional status. Uh, for example, complete streets policies, <clears throat> and implementation of uh, those transportation improvements or multimodal. Um, improvements. So here's a graph that um, kind of explains the health, what measure, how the health-related quality of life is measured. So measuring the health-related quality of life within a community helps characterize the burden of disabilities and chronic uh, disease in a population. In addition to measuring how long people live, it also measures how healthy people are while alive. So in implementing complete streets in the form of bike lanes, sidewalks, trails, um, et cetera, not only helps to increase the lifespan of a person, but also increase the number of years that a person is in good health during their lifespan. Um, and that can be seen depicted on the, the graph where the lifespan without intervention is shorter than the lifespan with intervention. So not only the time in years is shorter, but the time of years in good health is shorter. Um, also, this can eventually lead to 
lowering chronic disease and decreasing doctor and hospital visits, which that's a whole nother, um, you know, topic when we talk about aging and community health and um, rural hospitals. So it all just kind of, uh, you know, interconnects. So complete streets implementation, how do we get there as, as a community um, and working together? So one way to move toward implementing complete streets is to reach out to your regional commissions, your MPOs, your local planners. Um, here at the Southern Georgia Regional Commission, we've created various documents to assist local governments with implementing complete streets initiatives. Um, and also can help with complete streets policy development and implementation. Um, so here are just a few documents that we've created. These links will go out later to our website we'll, where um, you'll have access to read these documents. We also created this one, Agent in Place, which also talks about enhancing and sustaining um, you know, older adults within the community, their mobility. And that, once again, goes back to, to providing that access to active transportation. So when planning uh, to look into complete streets projects for certain communities, some of the planning work may have already been done for you through the plans at your regional commissions or your city and county planners um, or your MPOs or nonprofits, just whoever is already out there doing this stuff like Chip earlier. He has lots of information. So always look to those different partners to um try to get the information you need to, to implement complete streets um, when you're looking at policies and all. You know, just implementing complete streets and encouraging a culture of active, healthy lifestyles through active transportation is beneficial um, in many ways. And that concludes my presentation. My contact information is on the slide. And also, I believe uh, Sheena will be sending out that information as well. I mean, this was excellent. I'm going to tap y'all's uh, website to get some of those resources. So all of this was good. Thank you. And, and you brought out some good points about it. Not sometimes you try to tell communities it doesn't cost sometimes to make uh, slight modifications to streets. Sometimes right. you resurface and you can do some of these things at that point. You're already paying for what to be resurfaced. So some right. of these things can be made at no cost. And your uh, presentation, you link back to, um, I think, Ron's with the socio demographic, the health information. So mm -hmm. I'm going to try to make sure I'm the in the group that's with intervention because I want to live a long time. <laughs> right. <laughs> so thank you. Well, thank so you. <laughs> thank y'all for having me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. And Julio, I see you on. I see you. Are you you ready to continue? I'm here. Hey, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you so much. I would thank you all for uh, having me. I'm uh, Julio Portillo. And uh, like Barbara said, I was with River Valley uh, for 12 years and uh, as a transportation planner. And in those 12 years, in the 16 counties that we covered, we did accomplish uh, two significant things. Uh, that was developing a complete streets policy for the city of Americas and the same for the city of Columbus. And so we worked on creating policy, uh, you know, drafting some policy documents, and nothing super lengthy, about a couple pages long, but that truly addressed uh, immediate needs uh, that both communities have very different needs. Um, and got those uh, adopted uh, by city council and just started working on those. Uh, so fast forward not a couple of years, um, through my work at Midtown Inc., uh, a lot of uh, pretty much everything that we do at Midtown Columbus is driven through transportation. And so Complete Streets is at the you know, front, back and center of all the projects, uh, or at least the most significant projects that we are uh, tackling as a nonprofit. Uh, so uh, on my screen, I'm sharing with you guys uh, our minimum grid uh, project. This was a 2016 uh, idea that we submitted to the Knight, Knight Foundation in Miami. Um, and the actually the application was a 140 uh, character tweet that we had to submit. Um, it was an, a national uh, uh, competition and we were one of the 35 uh, projects that were funded. Um, for uh, for the Knight Foundation, so we created we we sent this idea of creating a minimum grid, and we hired a state of the art, uh, one of the best uh, 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 international uh, planners, uh, uh, designers to come into Columbus and really help us figure out how to best connect uh, connect Midtown Columbus to Uptown Columbus. Uh, so Gale Studios from Copenhagen and New York City came uh, worked with us for about eight months in developing. The map that you see on your screen, on your screens, 
Uh, and it was this very comprehensive map showing the places of places we love, the uh, places of interest, uh, the type of uh, the road usage, um, and where where we could best uh, implement some uh, complete street conversions. Um, the biggest thing from this minimum grid project is it allowed us to to really rethink the way we see and utilize roadways. Uh, so now we think of roads as public spaces, the way the same way we think of a park. Um, or, or the river in, in this case, um, is really utilizing the road and seeing it as a public space um, and, and rethinking its value and, and what its impact outside of just uh, transporting vehicles. Uh, so one of the things that uh, once we got that plan adopted and, and completed, then we started uh, moving into uh, you know measuring and testing, refining our, our design, and just really doing some pilot projects to start implementing portions of that plan. Um, the biggest thing is 13th Street in Columbus, which is Spur 22, uh, uh, Georgia DOT Road. Uh, we took it from five lanes to three lanes. So we took the outside lanes and made them into uh, travel lanes um, for portions of that road. And other portions of that road uh, were in the process of adding diagonal and parallel parking as a means to uh, you know, reactivate uh, economic development and businesses there. There's, there's a lot of these businesses, actually most of them, the parking is in the, on, in the rear, in, in the back of the, um, of, the, of the storefront. So there really is no storefront uh, parking, on-road parking. Uh, so you can see some images here when we were uh, piloting the project, we tested it with just putting out some barrels out there and uh, some signs. And then we actually uh, got out there with one of the city planners and. I uh, used the old um, water and cornstarch corn and food dye method and, and just painted a, uh, a green bike lane for a couple, a couple of days until it rained and washed out. Um, and then we did some programs to kind of activate uh, some of those uh, abandoned commercial storefronts. And we had a little market, a boutique. Uh, we had a brewery come, come over. Um, and it was, again, it was very, uh, it was very good to see uh, that when, when, when we started rethinking how to utilize that road, how to better provide, make it ADA compliant sidewalks and, and, and actually having sidewalks that connect somewhere, uh, people came out and they really, you know, really liked the, the work that was being done. And it's really revitalizing that corridor in, in terms of the investment and the relocation of several businesses now. So th this is the overall project. I think you can see the, the very top, this very top slide here shows uh, the portion of 13th Street that we are working on now. And you can see the parallel and diagonal parking there, some of the storefronts. Uh, this right here it, it shows the existing with uh, versus the proposed um, lane reconfiguration. Uh, this slide right here says a project we are working on um, with uh, one of our uh, investors, owns this uh, a, an entire block of commercial real estate and uh, he's you know very supportive and we're, we're testing out some artwork uh, some uh, design on their sidewalks uh, and how to you know, make it a little bit more appealing to see uh, that uh, parallel parking on his storefront and the slide next to it this is actually part of what we completed already along 13th street which has completely redeveloped uh, the villages on 13th, which is a, a uh, again another commercial um, uh, commercial development there that you know now is is one of the most booming places in Midtown. Um, it's right again, it's right next to Dinglewood Park, where you will see right here at the bottom. Now we are also working on creating the first children's bicycle park, uh, which would be the first of its kind in Columbus within a 107 mile radius, um, including Alabama. Uh, so, you know, again, 13th Street and the work, the complete streets uh, project that we're implementing has really ignited a, a, a just a complete redevelopment of, of that corridor. Now we have businesses relocating. We have a, a children's bike, bike park coming. Uh, this bottom uh, right slide here is the Dragonfly Trail, which is the multi-use trail that's coming through, again, through this, uh, through Dinglewood Park connecting to Lake Bottom Park, which is all connected to 13th Street. Um, the Dragonfly Trail is a multi-use trail that when completed, will be 64 miles uh, of dedicated uh, multi-use trails ar around the, the city of Columbus. Of those 64, 38 miles already have been completed and about six of them, eight, eight miles of it go through Midtown. So again, it's very, very, very important to us 
uh, not just to have the trail, but how do we connect, how do we provide connectivity to the trail? And again, when, when, when we create, uh, when, when we build these facilities, when we plan for them, uh, the, the first hurdle is always to, uh, you know, get it designed, get it approved, get the community behind it. Uh, but once you build it, then, then what happens? And so uh, part of what we do at Midtown as well is programming. Uh, so we create this, you know, we're, we're bringing these facilities, we're reactivating points of, points of interest. Uh, so now we're, we're bringing along programming as well, just to bring people out and have them, you know, give them an, an excuse to experience uh, what it is that we are building and, and try to see it in a, in a different light. Uh, the midtime bike around is one that it's a five mile bike around through our neighborhoods, uh, through our bike lanes and the Dragonfly Trail. Uh, where we just get together one Thursday uh, during bike month. Uh, this year, we took about 70 people uh, out on a bike tour, come back, we'll buy them all a beer, and we have a great time. People of all ages come join. Um, it's very, very relaxed, very laid back, and we, we just have a really, really good time. Uh, along when we do uh, road work, uh, we focus a lot on landscaping and beautification. Uh, so Clean Midtown is one of our, our initiatives where we have adopted a lot of uh, uh, public, public right-of-way that we upkeep uh, from planners like you see on this picture. And that's one of our board members. Um, uh, you know, we, 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 we do different shrubs, vegetation to very intricate lighting and seasonal flowers and a lot of the, the spots that we adopt. Um, as we are reactivating points, and points of interest through uh, better road uh, facilities, uh, our parks get a lot of attention. So here you see uh, two, two events that we do to bring people to the park. Uh, it's one is at the Midtown Get Down, it's a big family concert. And then we've also installed a lot of public art uh, uh, through a lot of our points of interest. And that is that red frame that you see there at Lake Bottom Park. Uh, that is a, it started as a place where you would stand and place your phone on a pedestal that's a couple of feet away and take a family picture of this red frame. Well, then quickly that red frame just turned into a tiny stage. Uh, and now one of the Columbus State University music professor, uh, she hosts uh, quarterly uh, concerts out there. And we, you know, people bring their lawn chair, their cooler, their dogs. And a uh, Saturday afternoon, we just have about an hour or two of just free music. And it's, it's, it's really great. The, the, the key thing here is that we have seen people uh, coming to our events on, on ways that are outside of their vehicles. Um, and, and again, being the way Midtown is designed and where it is located, uh, walkability and bikeability are key. And so seeing people truly embrace neighborhood living and walking to amenities that are a tenth of a block from their house, uh, just you know, and walking with their, with their family, with their children, walking with their lawn chairs um, has truly been, been as inspiring for the work that we uh, that we are doing in implementing these complete streets projects uh, throughout throughout the Midtown community. Uh, that is all I have for you all. Uh, here's my contact information. Uh, happy to get in touch with anybody or answer any questions if you if you have any. I know we've gone over time. Thank you so much, everybody, for hanging in with us. And instead of me doing the poll questions, and for those who have. Um, stuck it out with us. Uh, Sheena, if you would help me, mm -hmm. um, if there are folks that have had their hands raised or who want to ask a question, any questions for our speakers? I want to say to Julio, this is the first that I'm meeting you virtually, but it won't be the last. I don't know if you know that um, River Valley, we're really proud in Georgia that we are leading in the country in our age-friendly work. And um, the three regions, uh, we have six regions now. So River Valley was our third, Southwest was our first, Southern was our second. And um, before River Valley became age-friendly, Columbus did. So you're working with us and we're working with everybody, but wanted you to make that connection. And we really appreciate your leadership and the work that you're doing at uh, in Columbus Midtown and what you were doing in River Valley. I see a question, I think it says iPhone. So I'm going to unmute you. And if you can, if you can ask your question, yeah. please go ahead. 
Good morning. This is Roger Haggerty in Albany, Georgia, with the with the Pecan City Peddlers. Uh, it's awesome listening to Chip talk today. Um, yes. And he had to leave out. He's also a school teacher, so he had to, he had to leave out. But I just want to make sure I heard when the discussion came up about the streets, uh, the highways in Early County in that area, that a statement was made that the rumble strips were put in the wrong areas of the road. It should have been closer to the on, on the white line instead of in the middle of the bike lane. Is that correct? Yes. 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 Where they put the rumble strips at on on that roadway, it didn't leave any space for um, bicyclists. Had they considered bicyclists, they would have shifted all of that and left space. OK, to follow up my question, then um, we have a number of roads uh, that we cycle along uh, Highway 32 going up from Leesburg to uh, to Dawson, Larry Road uh, from Larry to, into Albany. Uh, the rumble strips make it hard to ride <laughs> there. Who do we need to talk to about this? Um, I will reach out to if it's if it's the, the state route, then you probably want to reach out to your district uh, GDOT engineer. Okay. And have them consider when they're repaving, as the example that Chip gave us, they actually repaved the road and then still didn't make it bicycle friendly. So they they need to have those considerations in place when they get ready to do any type of improvements. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, they what Chip mentioned was uh, Gainville Road uh, going from Albany up to uh, uh to Newton, uh, they repaved that road, and it's it's a complete rumble strip. You can't even ride on it. It's, it's that it's that bad, so right? And it should be done like that. They should leave space for bicyclists. Um, so hopefully, you can reach out to him and or her, and they can do something about that. Um, because of course, the rumble strip is also a protection. It's a barrier for you all as well. So if they're going over that white line, you know they're going to hit those rumble strips. So that serves as a, a type of, um, you know, safety. Yeah, correct. When I when I hear a rumble, somebody going the rumble strip, and I'm on a narrow road, I go off. <laughs> I go right. Off. <laughs> but, just, but thank you for sharing that, and I'll pass that on to Chip. We can talk to the DOT. And, yes, um, most definitely. And I, that Thank person you. is out of Tifton. Um, I don't have their, I have their contact information, but I'm actually doing my presentation from another office, so I don't have it handy. But if Chip could just send me an uh, email, my contact information is in the slide, but our, your GDOT person is out of Tifton. But if you could send me an uh, uh, email or uh, I will get that information for you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. I think... Um... Let's do a la one of our polls. I think we want to get, want to know if this was helpful. Okay, sure. Are you going All to make right. it, Kate? We won't end the poll, Kate. We'll leave yeah, it up. Please don't. <laughs> <laughs> please don't end the poll. Uh, just really quickly get a pulse from our audience. Give it a few minutes. We did have yeah. another um, question seconds, in the rather. chat. Oh, good. Go ahead, um, Amy. Do you? I can't see it because I've got the. Well, it says in. in Connecticut, I believe our towns are uh, constantly being told it's hard to get anything done on a state road that runs through a municipality. Getting approval can take a long time. I am told is that a problem in Georgia? Also, are the laws regarding what you are allowed to do according to state law, for example, diagonal crosswalks are types of flashing signs, et cetera, that are used in other states and frustrate your ability to make streets safer. Um, that would have been a good one, actually, for Ron mm -hmm. to answer. Um, does anybody else have any other information about that, about getting things done on a state road um, <clears throat> that runs through a municipality? Uh, I don't know. I would say like hmm. our GDOT planners and people we have worked with that over at uh, our GDOT, our G Department of Transportation for Georgia, um, we have a pretty good relationship with them down in the southern Georgia region. Um, for us, you know, it's kind of it's kind of hit and miss. It just depends on what's going on. But I would definitely say 
anytime that you can get your your local planners to do um you know a walk audit or a safety audit um definitely reach out and try to have an engineer from your district with you when you do that audit now that has been beneficial for us we've been able to get signage around schools that are on highways because here in you know in the in in the south i know a lot of our schools tend to be on highways Mm -hmm. um and not necessarily in communities um so it's always good to make sure that you at least have someone from the state department transportation Mm -hmm. department out there with you um when you're doing that and then about the crosswalks i'm not so sure about that kind of stuff i know julio mentioned some stuff earlier about crosswalks um maybe he has a take on that that part of the question and I don't know. Um, I don't know who's still there. Yeah, so crosswalks are very tricky, um, both locally and 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 with with GDOT. Um, you know, there's just so colors, patterns. Uh, you know, we get really really excited and and try to do. Um, uh, you know, we want to do like this pian- this piano keyboard musical crosswalk, <laughs> and 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 in this. Uh, case funding and, and creativity were not the issues uh, but it was you know keeping them compliant to you know to other road users too and so that we we quickly learned that that you can do a lot of things but you have to work your creativity within the parameters that the GDA requires on their um on their crosswalks and 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 locally as well you know with the, with the uh, local ordinances here for the city of Columbus um, something as simple as stamp brick on, on our crosswalks it is things we had to navigate uh, through. But so instead of us imposing our ideas, we worked our ideas around um, their requirements and kind of we kind of always had been able so far to reach a consensus on, on those things. Well, thank you for and that perspective. I'm sorry, Barbara, go just, ahead. Just understand that things do take time, no matter what Mm -hmm. state you live in. I'm sure Amy and Julio, we all have great relationships with GDOT. However, and Amy, that's good information. Work with your local planners, uh, that's the regional commission. Work with communities, you know, safety and Mm -hmm. knowledge. And, and, you know, sometimes it starts just with a letter and, uh, and, and then from that, it may lead to some type of an audit. But just be patient. You know, you just have to be patient with uh, the process because it is a process. And uh, sometimes it does take a, a while, but just stick with it. But um, there's there are no quick turnarounds on these things. It's just it's, sometimes they're two, three years in the making, sometimes even longer. So I can't give you a, a, a shortcut to it. Uh, but we, as I said, we have great relationships with GDOT and uh, they're always willing and help us work through issues, but just patients and, and working with your local officials. Yeah, that's definitely true. It definitely takes time and, um, you know, just just definitely have everything in place to make that case as well. Not just go to them and say, hey, we want this, but make sure, once again, if they're, you're out there doing safety audits, walk audits, you have someone out there so they can see, because a lot of times in your municipality, they're not as familiar, of course, as the local community with what's going on on the issues that you may have. So, um, you know, so that includes what Ron spoke about earlier when you talk, when you're, um, you know, trying to get something done, your crash data, your data on how many pedestrians or bicyclists take that route, just, just various things like that. Make sure you have that information as well. I know that we've gone way over and I'm really grateful that everybody is uh, engaged. I think, Greg, you were trying to say something. Greg, were you going to jump in? Yeah, and say I was just, hey, I was just going to concur with what's been uh, mentioned with Amy um, mm-hmm. regarding the relationship with GDOT and your district engineer. Uh, here in Macon Bib, uh, we've performed some road safety audits. And as a result of those road safety audits, we've been able to make some um improvements along two roadways like uh, Eisenhower Parkway. It's a state route, uh, a U.S. route, actually, that runs through Macon. And then 
Pionono Avenue. It's a state route as well. And as a result of some road safety audits that we've conducted, uh, GDOT made some um, modifications to those roadways based on what came out of the road safety audit that we performed. For the interest of time, I just want to say thank you, everybody, for your time, your leadership, your commitment in the work that we all are doing, trying to ensure that our um, our streets and highways and roadways are in our neighborhoods, commercial and residential areas, school zones, et cetera, that we are all safe because it takes all of us. And as you've heard from our experts, um, it, it, it can take years. So, you know, I know that the word patience sometimes is not um, uh, easy to hear, especially if you have lost loved ones um, on these um, in an unfortunate way. Um, but please, your advocacy is needed um, for us to be able to implement uh, a lot of the work that is needed for us to be safe, whether we're walking, biking, on the scooter, um, or in the car. Have a wonderful day. Barbara? Thank you all so much for coming uh, and participating and staying with us. We know we ran over, but thank you all so much. And thank you for the questions and the interaction and the engagement. We appreciate it. Um, everyone on the program, thank you. Amy, Julio, my team, thank you all for stepping in. You, I know some of it was last minute, but it's appreciated. And, you know, if you ever need me, and I'm sure I speak for Kay and Myrtle as well, uh, Regional Commission or AARP, you can just reach out and we'll do the best we can. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks, Nicole, for joining us. Bye, everybody. Happy mm -hmm. summer. Bye. Stay, Thank stay you. Bye. Bye. Bye.